Never in the history of the world did the poor man without capital have such an opportunity to get rich quickly and honestly as he has now. I say to you, you ought to get rich. It is your duty to get rich. How many of my pious brethren say to me, do you, a Christian minister, spend your time going up and down the country advising young people to get rich to get money? Yes, of course I do, they say. Isn't that awful? Why don't you preach the gospel instead of preaching about man's making money? Because to make money honestly is to preach the gospel. That is the reason. And men who get rich may be the most honest men you will find in the community. Oh, but says some young man here tonight, I have been told all my life that if a person has money he is very dishonest and dishonorable and mean and contemptible. My friend, that is the reason why you have none. Because you have that idea that people, the foundation of your faith is altogether false. Let me say here clearly and let me say it briefly. Though subject to discussion, which I have not time for here, 98 out of 100 of the rich men of America are honest. That is why they are rich. That is why they are trusted with money. That is why they carry on great enterprises and find plenty of people to work with them. It is because they are honest men. Says another young man, I hear sometimes of men that get millions of dollars dishonestly. Yes, of course you do, and so do I. But they are the rare thing, in fact, that the newspapers talk about them all the time as a matter of news until you get the idea that all of the other rich men got rich dishonestly. My friend, you take and drive me if you furnish the auto out to the suburbs of Philadelphia and introduce me to the people who own their homes around this great city. These beautiful homes with gardens and flowers, these magnificent homes so lovely in their art and I will introduce you to the very best people in character, as well as an enterprise in our city. And you know I will. A man is not really a true man until he owns his own home, and they that own their homes are made more honorable and honest and pure and true and economical and careful by owning the home. For a man to have money, even in large sums, is an inconsistent thing. We preach against covetousness and you know we do in the pulpit and oftentimes preach against it so long and we use the term about filthy lucre so extremely that Christians get the idea that when we stand in the pulpit we believe it is wicked for any man to have money until the collection basket goes around and then we almost swear at the people because they don't give more money. Oh, the inconsistency of such doctrines as that. Money is power, and you ought to be reasonably ambitious to have it. You ought because you can do more good with it than you can without it. Money printed your Bible, money builds your churches, money sends your missionaries, money pays your preachers, and you would not have them either if you did not pay them. I am always willing that a church should raise my salary because the church that pays the largest salary always raises it the easiest. You never know an exception to that in your life. The man who gets the largest salary can do the most good with the power that is furnished to him. Of course, he can, if his spirit is right, to use it for what it is given to him. I say then, you ought to have money. If you can honestly attain your riches in Philadelphia, it is your Christian and godly duty to do so. It is an awful mistake of those pious people who think you must be awfully poor in order to be pious. Some men say, don't you sympathize with the poor people? Of course I do, or else I would not have been lecturing these years. I won't give in, but what I sympathize with the poor, but the number of poor who are to be sympathized with are very small. To sympathize with a man who God has punished for his sins, thus to help him, when God would still continue a just punishment is to do wrong, no doubt about it. And we do more than we help those who are deserving. While we should sympathize with God's poor, that is, those who cannot help themselves, let us remember there is not a poor person in the United States who was not made poor by his own shortcomings. 
or the shortcomings of someone else. It is all wrong to be poor. Let us give in to the argument and pass that to one side. A gentleman gets up back here and says, Don't you think there are some things in this world that are better than money? Of course I do, but I am talking about money now. Of course there are some things higher than money. Oh yes, I know, by the grave that has left me standing above, that there are some things in this world that are higher and sweeter and purer than money. Well, I do know there are some things higher and grander than gold. Love is the grandest thing on God's earth, but fortunate the lover who has plenty of money. Money is power, money is force. Money will do good as well as harm in the hands of good men and women. It could accomplish, and it has accomplished good. I hate to leave that behind me. I heard a man get up in a prayer meeting in our city and thank the Lord for he was one of God's poor. Well, I wonder what he, his wife thinks about that. He earns all the money that comes into this house and he smokes a part of it on the veranda. I don't want to say any more of the Lord's poor of that kind and I don't believe the Lord does and yet there is some people who think in order to be pious you must be awfully poor and awfully dirty. That does not follow at all. While we sympathize with the poor, let us not teach a doctrine like that. Yet the age is prejudiced against advising a Christian man, or as a Jew would say, a godly man, from attaining unto wealth. The prejudice is so universal, and the years are far enough back, I think, for me to safely mention that years ago at Temple University there was a young man in our theological school who thought he was the only pious student in that department. He came into my office one evening and sat down by my desk and told me, Mr. President, I think it is my duty, sir, to come in and labor with you. What has happened now? said he. I heard you say at the academy that the Pierce School commencement that you thought it was an honorable ambition for a young man to desire to have wealth, and that you thought it made him temperate, made him anxious to have a good name, and made him industrious. You spoke about man's ambition to have money helping to make him a good man. Sir, I have come to you to tell you the Holy Bible says that money is the root of all evil. I told him I had never seen it in the Bible and advised him to go out to the chapel and get the Bible and show me the place. So out he went for a Bible and as soon as he stalked into my office with the Bible open, with all the bigoted pride of a narrow sectarian or of one who founds his Christianity on some misinterpretation of scripture, he flung the Bible down on my desk and fairly squealed into my ear. There it is, Mr. President, you can read it for yourself, I said to him. Well, young man, you will learn when you get a little older that you cannot trust another denomination to read the Bible for you. You belong to another denomination. You are taught in a theological school, however, that emphasizes the exogenous. Now you will take that Bible and read it yourself and give it the proper emphasis to it. He took the Bible and proudly read, The love of money is the root of all evil. Then he had it right. And when one does quote a right from the same old book, he quotes the absolute truth. I have lived through fifty years of the mightiest battle that old book has ever fought, and I have lived to see its banners flying free, for never in the history of this world did the great minds of earth so universally agree that the Bible is true, all true, as they do at this very hour. So I say that when he quoted right, of course he quoted the absolute truth. The love of money is the root of all evil. He who tries to attain unto it too quickly or dishonestly will fail into the many snares, no doubt about that. The love of money, what is that? It is making an idol of money, an idolry pure and simple, everywhere has condemned by the holy scriptures and by man's common sense. The man that worships the dollar instead of thinking of its purposes for which it ought to be used the man who idolizes simply money, the miser that hoards his money in the cellar or hides it in a stocking or refuses to invest it where it will do the world good, that man who hugs the dollar until the eagle squeals, in him the root of all evil. I think I will leave that behind now and answer the question of nearly all of you who are asking, 
is there an opportunity to get rich in Philadelphia? Well now, how simple a thing it is to see where it is. The instant you see where it is, it is yours. Some old gentleman gets up there in back and says, Mr. Conwell, have you lived in Philadelphia for 41 years and you don't know that the time has gone when you can make anything in this city? No, I don't think it is. Yes, it is. I have tried it. What business are you in? I kept a store here for 20 years and never made over a thousand dollars in the whole 20 years. Well, then you can measure the good you have been to this city by what the city has paid you, because a man can judge you very well with what he is worth by what he receives, that is, in what he is to the world at this time. If you have not made over a thousand dollars in twenty years in Philadelphia, it would have been better for Philadelphia if they kicked you out of the city nineteen years and nine months ago. A man has no right to keep a store in Philadelphia twenty years and not make at least five thousand dollars even though it be a corner grocery uptown, you say. You cannot make $5,000 in a store now? Oh, my friends, if you will just take only four blocks around you and find out what the people want and what you ought to supply and set them down with your pencil and figure up the profits you would make if you did supply them, you would very soon see it. There is wealth right here within the sound of your voice. Then someone says, you don't know anything about business. A preacher never knows a thing about business. Well then, I will have to prove to you I am an expert. I don't like to do this, but I have to do it because my testimony will not be taken if I am not an expert. My father kept a country store, and if there is any place under the stars where a man gets all sorts of experience in every kind of mercantile transactions, it is the country store. I am not proud of my experience, but sometimes when my father was away, he would leave me in charge of the store, though fortunately for him it was not very often. But this did occur many times, friends. A man would come into the store and say, Do you keep jackknives? No, we don't keep jackknives. So, and I went off whistling a tune. What did I care about that man anyhow? And then another farmer would come in and say, Do you keep jackknives? No, we don't keep jackknives. Then I went away and whistled another tune. Then a third man came right up to the door and said, Do you keep jackknives? No. Why, everyone around here is asking for jackknives. Do you suppose we are keeping this store to supply the whole neighborhood with jackknives? Do you carry on this store like that in Philadelphia? The difficult was I had not learned that the foundation of godliness and the foundation of principle of success in business are both the same precisely. When a man says, I cannot carry my religion into business, he advertises himself either as being an imbecile in business or on the road to bankruptcy or a thief, one of the three. Sure, he will fail within a very few years. He certainly will if he doesn't carry his religion into business. If I had been carrying on my father's store on a Christian plan, godly plan. I would have had a jackknife for the third man when he called for it. Then I would have actually done him a kindness, and I would have received a reward myself, which would have been my duty to take. There are some over-pious Christian people who think if they take a profit on anything you sell, you are an unrighteous man. On the contrary, you would be a criminal to sell goods for less than they cost. You have no right to do that. You cannot trust a man with your money who cannot take care of his own. You cannot trust a man in your family who is not true to his own wife. You cannot trust a man in the world who does not begin with his own heart, his own character, and his own life. It would have been my duty to have furnished a jackknife to the third man or the second, and to have sold it him and actually profited myself. I would have no more right to sell goods without making a profit on them then I would have to overcharge him dishonestly beyond what they are worth. But I should so sell each bill of goods that the person to whom I sell shall make as much as possible. To live and let live is the principle of the gospel and the principle of everyday common sense. O oh, young man, hear me. Live as you go along. Do not wait until you have reached my years before you begin to enjoy anything in this life. If I had the millions back, or fifty cents of it, 
which I have tried to earn in these years, it would not do me anything like the good it does me now in this almost sacred presence tonight. Oh yes, I am paid over a hundredfold tonight for dividing as I have tried to do so in some measure as I went along through the years. I ought not speak that way. It sounds agnostic, but I am old enough now to be excused for that. I should have helped my fellow man, which I have tried to do, and everyone should try and do and go get the happiness of it. The man who goes home with a sense that he has stolen a dollar that day, that he has robbed a man of what is his honest due, is not going to sweet rest. He arises tired in the morning and goes with an unclean conscience to his work the next day. He is not a successful man at all, although he may have laid up millions, but the man who has gone through life dividing always with his fellow man, making and demanding his own rights and his own profits, and giving away every other man his rights and profit, lives every day. But not only that, but the royal road to great wealth, the history of the thousands of millionaires shows that to be the case. The man over there who said he could not make anything in a store in Philadelphia has been carrying on his store in the wrong principle. I suppose I go unto you store tomorrow and say, do you know neighbor A who lives one square away at house number 1240? Oh yes, I have met him. He deals here at the corner store. Where did he come from? I don't know. How many does he have in his family? I don't know. What ticket does he vote? I don't know. What church does he go to? I don't know, and I don't care. Why are you asking all of these questions for? If I had a store in Philadelphia, would you answer me like that? If so, then you are conducting your business, just as I carried on my father's business in Worthington, Massachusetts. You don't know where your neighbor come from when he moved to Philadelphia, and you don't care. If you had cared, you would be a rich man now. If you had cared enough about him to take an interest in his affairs, to find out what he needed, you would have been rich. But now you go through the world saying no opportunity to get rich, and there is the fault right at your own door. But another young man gets up over there and says, I cannot take up the mercantile business. While I am talking of trade, it applies to every occupation. Why can't you go into the mercantile business? Because I haven't any capital. Oh, the weak and duddish creature that can't see over its collar. It makes a person weak to see those little dudes standing around in the corners and saying, oh, if I had plenty of capital, how rich I would get. Young man, do you think you are going to get rich on capital? Certainly. Well, I say certainly not. Your mother has plenty of money, and she will set you up in business. You will set her up in business, supplying you with capital. The moment the young man or woman gets more money than he or she has grown to by practical experience, the moment he has gotten a curse. It is no help to a young man or woman to inherit money. It is no help to your children to leave them money. But if you leave them education, if you leave them Christian and noble character, if you leave them a wide circle of friends, if you leave them an honorable name, it is far better than they should have money. It would be worse for them, worse for the nation, that they should have money at all. Oh, young man, if you have inherited money, don't regard it as a help. It will curse you through your years and deprive you of the very best things of human life. There is no class of people to be pitied so much as the inexperienced sons and daughters of the rich of our generation. I pity the rich man's son. He can never know the best things in life. One of the best things in life is when a young man has earned his own living and when he becomes engaged to some lovely young woman and makes up his mind to have a home of his own. Then with that same love comes that divine inspiration toward better things. He begins to save money. He begins to leave off his bad habits and put money in the bank. When he has a few hundred dollars, he goes out to the suburbs to look for a home. He goes to the savings bank, perhaps for half the value, and he goes to his wife and takes the bride over the threshold of that door for the first time and says the words of eloquence my voice can never touch. I have earned this home myself. It is all mine, and I divide with thee. That is the grandest moment a human heart may ever know.